Paul Brandt. Oh, man. I hear you so good right now. <laughs> this is great. We got like awesome headphones going on here. So good. We're here inside the glass here at Cult Gathering Conference. Phenomenal. Yeah, Banff, Alberta. I tell you, I, I, I got my start doing a showcase in Banff about 26 years ago, uh, showcasing for the label, and, and that brings back so many memories to be here. And of course, you know, the gathering is just an incredible um, coming together of minds that are, you know, involved in branding and music, and uh, it's been it's just a lot of learning. It's been really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, dragging us along. We've been working oh. on a record together, and um, this is kind of a special episode of our Made It in Music podcast by Full Circle Music. We're recording live here at this phenomenal conference. And the introduction is, you know, thanks to you for inviting us along here. So I've been, I've been here taking notes, front row, Brene Brown. Oh, yeah. Uh, Beats by Dre, just some of the uh, leading brands. And I've, I've learned a ton of you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, glad that you guys could join. And it's been uh, just an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to work alongside you creatively in Nashville and, and uh, excited about new music coming. And, and yeah, I mean, this, this event, it, it's all been about, you know, not your typical sort of, hey, I've got a network so that I can find this next big thing that's going to just make my career the best thing ever. It's literally sort of mind share. People, you know, saying, hey, this is what works for me, what works for you, and creating relationship and community. And, and there the doesn't seem to be a whole lot of, like, you know, uh, premeditated, I, I got to make this work or everything's going to fall apart, sure. which is nice, you know. And, and uh, just beautiful setting, you know, here in the Rocky Mountains and, and uh, uh, hanging with people who I think really are in it for the right reasons. Yeah. So it's been a lot of fun. Well, it's been great to get to know you. And for our listeners who maybe don't know, the introduction actually came through another artist that we've worked with called High Valley. Yeah. Who <clears throat> Brad, the singer for High Valley, would always talk about this mythical <laughs> creature in the Canadian In the Canadian music. wilderness. <laughs> There's this Paul Brandt guy, but he, he, it, it, he almost talked about you on the level of just being a really kind of a father figure for for their journey in music and i was like man i gotta meet this guy no you know i, I love those guys so much um i saw them performing at a canadian country music awards showcase uh they used to have um a, a gospel showcase and they don't have that anymore but um uh, it was in a, a venue in, in Saskatchewan, a small church, and uh, at that time, High Valley, they were uh, traveling and performing as three brothers, and uh, I saw them on stage, and I, this doesn't happen to me a lot, but I literally had a flash forward. I could see them on the Grand Ole Opry stage. Wow. For some reason, I just knew these guys had that X factor, and, wow. and so I, I had been given a, a, a demo recording that they had done, and I went up and talked to Brad and, and, and just said, hey, I think you guys are doing a really great job. Keep going. You know, it's just, it's just one of those kind of really quick conversations and all of a sudden I mean if you've ever met Brad he doesn't let anything go and uh, he's, he's you know calling and phoning and texting and everything and, and we became great friends through that and, and have had a lot of great opportunities to work together so we, I've learned a ton from them too they're yeah. amazing amazing talents so so that's where they started I want I want to hear where Paul Brandt started what was the first dollar that you ever made in the music business oh man um, it was probably I remember I had an uncle who um, saw some uh, some potential in what I was doing. And, and um, he said, you know, there's a talent show at the Calgary Exhibition and Stampede, our big fair that we have in rodeo here every year. And uh, he said, I think you ought to you know, go and try it. I was 16 years old. I'd only been playing guitar for about three years, but I was writing a lot. I love to write. And uh, I, I figured, you know, at 16, the top prize was a thousand bucks if you won. And I figured I'd be set for life if I could win a thousand bucks. You know, this is going to be <laughs> it, you know, for me. And uh, so I entered the contest and performed my own uh, original music. And the first year I placed in the top 10, but I didn't, you know, I didn't make any prize money. And the, the second year, um, I don't think I really placed at all. And the third year, um, I won the thing. And uh, so I got that thousand bucks and I got a chance to, to travel uh, to Eastern Canada um, and perform in another talent contest there and then down to Memphis. Mm. And uh, the Memphis trip was amazing for me because we had a chance to uh, meet with, um, you know, just groups of artists that were starting out. But in the States, there was just sort of this... Um, professionalism and seriousness that I had never seen as a part of the industry and it kind of changed things for us in, in a lot of ways but yeah that yeah. probably that thousand bucks is the first uh, the first one hey that's pretty good so so what was the moment that music enabled you to go full-time uh, you know I remember um, in my, in my story is really uh, different I think than a lot of people you hear about the 10 you know the 10-year overnight success stories and you know so many people put so much work into it the work for me I think came after the fact in some ways but I I was working at the Alberta Children's Hospital I was a registered nurse and I worked there for a couple of years mm -hmm. always doing music because I loved it 
and uh, never really thinking seriously that it could actually t- become something that would be a career. Um, I, I thought it'd be great if it did, but I don't know that I really let myself think that it could. Mm. And uh, I w- really wanted to work in ICU, and I, I got the opportunity to work there. And literally the same week, I got offered a record deal um, uh, by Warner Reprise Nashville, and, and um, that's kind of when, when things started to change. I didn't quit my day job right away, even yeah. though I had a deal. Yeah. Um, I would go down to Nashville, write, get to know people, come back, work at the hospital, and finally they said, okay, this is it, you're, you know, we're, we're going on the road, and uh, it's, it's either this or, or, or your past job. So we jumped in full, full force back in... Boy, 96. Yeah. Well, you've, you've had, you've been really, really smart over the course of your career of using other things to fuel your music addiction. Mm-hmm. I, I like the way that you put that. Cool. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm not sure if it was smart as much as it was just guided in the right places. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think that, um, you know, for us, we left uh, the record label in Nashville um, at that time when, you know, the MP3 was transitioning the entire uh, industry Mm -hmm. and you know um, the timing to leave and become independent couldn't have been better now I didn't in in, you know in in hindsight there's no way I could have known that but becoming an independent artist in that era where you could still be an independent artist but still look as big as an artist that was being funded by a major label uh, that was just a short period of time and we were there at the right moment and and because we were independent we started thinking about uh, different ways to be able to monetize um, the business mm. and um, and trying to find ways to do that where it wasn't selling out it was actually um, uh, making our uh, creating a brand rub so that our, our brand was being elevated mm. and the brands that we were getting associated were also being elevated and so yeah for you know probably the last decade or so um, those brand alliances have allowed us in a very organic way and I think a way that benefits you know all parties uh, to fund the music addiction and keep making music so that you know we can just perpetuate the cycle and and I've been I'm very thankful for that man and there's something to that because I know that every artist and really the currency of what makes an artist successful is authenticity. Mm -hmm. People gravitate towards, um, I mean, that's why brands want artists because they portray a authentic message and they're, they're, they're the mouthpiece for that in a most natural way. How, can you just talk a little bit about that of how do you do that without feeling like you're selling out or that you're I like... I spent many years trying to practice how to fake authenticity. <laughs> you, you can't do it. It's impossible. No, I, I think that, you know, it requires on the part of the artist, just like big brands do, yeah. uh, um, a laser focus on what the main thing is. What's mm-hmm. that grand why? What, what are the reasons that you're doing what you're doing? And allowing everything else surrounding the brand, everything else surrounding your artistry to serve that one main thing. Yeah. And, and that's what proves authenticity. You know, when, when you have a six-figure deal come your way, and if it doesn't fit through the filter that you said, hey, this is the most important thing for me, um, and you don't turn it down... Well, then you're not authentic. You're in it. You're in it because you're you're you know trying to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money, but if it's not done for the right reasons, then I think it can become destructive to brands, and it definitely erodes artistry. And and so I I think that's sort of the secret, you know, is is trying to figure out okay, does this fit into all those things that I always said I really believed in? Mm. And if it does, then it's probably a good direction to take. Yeah, and if I recall, there's a story that really kind of illustrates that perfectly. We were just talking this morning yeah. about it. Yeah, you're you're literally sitting with a record label at a table and do you care to maybe just share yeah. a little bit about that? I just think that's such a great illustration. Well, you know, I, I, I remember about. the discussions that we had with the label. And what's interesting is that, you know, with this new project that we have now, um, we've, you know, been able to come to terms and, and recreate our alliance with that same label in a way that works for everybody. Um, but early on and in a different era of the music industry, I, I remember, um, you know, being in this meeting where, you know, you're in a boardroom and, and you know, all the marketing, you know, people are there, a and all, all the people running the label. And they talk about you as a as a product because you are and mm-hmm. and you know, they, the discussion was centered around our next album and and uh, what Paul Brandt would wear and what he would say and and what he would uh, uh, sing and I remember them um, playing a demo of a song and it was an undeniable hit in fact another artist uh, went on to have a huge hit with it and and um, but I didn't I didn't like the message it didn't match my brand 
And so I remember saying, you know, this isn't something that I really want to sing. And, and it got quite heated. Mm. Um, I remember one comment was, uh, well, you're an actor and that's what we're paying for. So you will sing this. And, uh, and you know, there's always that sort of pushback. You don't want people to tell you what to do. But I remember, you know, at the at kind of the height of the discussion, someone saying, uh, well, what's more important, what you believe or your career? And I'll tell you, they, they meant it as a slight, you know, it was meant it as sort of, hey, I'm going to get him in this aha moment. But I really let, I really internalized it and thought it through. And I had to actually come to terms with what was more important. And I, I think that if, if your artistry isn't springing from the things that you hold dear, those things that you would uh, put your life on the line for, um, eventually... Um, it's 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 going to uh, manifest, and I I think that there are people who can have success selling things that they don't believe in. But to me, those are usually those flash in the pans. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, so I'm I'm really glad they asked that question, and it changed the tra trajectory of our entire career. Well, what a story, and I, I feel like that alignment philosophically is what has made me such a fan of of Paul Brandt from from afar. So, um, and and not only that, but you. You have a heart that is beyond just building this Paul Brandt career. You've you've been pretty instrumental in helping elevate other artists mm. and mentor and help them ask and wrestle with some of those important questions. Yeah, it's it's a challenging um, uh, life path to be an artist, and I, I remember there was uh, a moment, you know, when I left the label, and you know, we were on our own, and. Um, there were some dark times, you know, you're, you're, you're really uh, doing a lot of self-reflection, trying to figure out why am I doing what I'm doing? I mean, now that I'm not signed anymore, these are some of the thoughts that go through my head. Now that I'm not signed anymore, does that mean I'm still an artist? I mean, I, I, I got so much of my identity from that. Mm. And I remember that identity piece was a really big thing for me during that time. And I didn't have anyone to kind of shepherd me along through that. I'll tell you, I did a lot of praying and I, 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 I read that Bible from beginning to end. And, you know, there was, there was you know, all of those things that, that um, you know, looking for some kind of guidance. And, and I think the thing that I just took solace in is that I really believe I was created to speak. Mm. I was created to sing. I was given those um, those abilities, and my focus needed to be about doing that, and mm -hmm. and and just allowing everything else to just happen the way that it, it was going to happen, and, and have the faith to step forward and do that. And if I can use my artistry to help other artists to figure that out, that's great. That's what I I, I love to be able to do. And so yeah, I, I'm excited to see that you know full circle full, full circle music and um, you know other organizations that I'm starting to see pop up now are all about hey, how can we make this easier for the artists and, and more um, beneficial for them um, in a way where, you know, um, they're going to have successful lives lives, and not just successful careers. Yeah. Well, I love it. And it, it's, it's, it's been quite a journey. And I, I do want to get to where you're at today with some of the new music, cool. and new single coming out, new EP coming out, yeah, all that good stuff. Yeah. But I've got a few questions, okay. which are our full circle five. Oh, it's the hot seat. Hot seat. Look out. What is your favorite book or record that you most commonly recommend people? Yeah, you know, um, books are easier for me than records. When I was growing up, we weren't allowed to listen to any music at all that was recorded um, and, and didn't have a radio or a television until I was about 13 years old. And so um, I'm a bit of a music scavenger. I'm looking around at, at everything all the time. But from a book standpoint, uh, one that is a bit of an older book but has been really a great resource to me is a book called Halftime. Mm -hmm. uh, it was written by a business leader named Bob Buford, and, and he tells his story story about figuring out what the main thing was for him and it's incredibly inspirational and it was it was very formative for me and my business to kind of figure out how to you know how to funnel all of the things that are coming at you so fast in this business so I'd highly recommend halftime it's good uh, second question failure only turns into a lesson if it shifts your perspective or the way that you behave it's not a gift unless it transforms you mm -hmm. so through that lens do you have a favorite failure moment? <laughs> oh man, how long do we have? <laughs> There's too many of those failure failure moments. Um, oh, I don't know. I I um I think that um, maybe not on as serious a note. There was a pretty funny moment here in Calgary at one point, and and uh, this isn't as philosophical as anything that we've been talking about, but it's still kind of fun. We had this this great stage setup, huge rock and roll entry, um, a, a, a kabuki reveal. So you know you got the big curtain and your shining light from behind, and you can see a silhouette of Paul Brandt on the front. And we had this huge flourish of music, and then the silhouette would be on the right side, and huge flourish of music, the silhouette on the left side, and then finally it would build up and build up to this crescendo and a giant you know 
Paul Brandt, you know, idol in the middle, up above the drums, and then the curtain drops. And there I am hovering above the drummer. He, they start into the first song, really rock and roll, jump over the drummer and, in, and out at the crowd. And it was in my hometown. So, I mean, this is a big deal, right? Well, I get out there and people are going absolutely nuts, except for the first two rows. No one will make eye contact. Everyone's kind of looking around and like nervous. And I'm like, this is bizarre. So I got even more in their faces. And I'm like, come on, you know, playing my guitar and everything. <laughs> well, this was about halfway through the tour when the practical joking starts. And I remember hearing in my ear monitor from uh, side stage with the, uh, the sound engineer, check your fly. <laughs> and and I like I like I'm thinking there's no way he's totally and I look over at him he is green and he's just pointing down and nodding up and down like you know really do this right I turned around and looked at the drummer and he's laughing so hard he can barely keep time anymore and I jumped back up on that riser turned my back to the audience and with one hand got that button fly done back up again and uh, and talent. that is some talent <laughs> the, you know the the comment on the radio station the next day was Paul Brandt gave us a bit more of a show than he intended yesterday so you know that this is a good a good thing for all artists to remember. You got to always check, check that fly. Your fly. <laughs> that is phenomenal <laughs> advice. I think I just looked down to make sure. Yeah, I'm, just in case. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, third question, uh, man. That's just that one's gonna stay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna forget that. Oh man. Were your parents there? Uh, I, they may have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before you dove fully in. What was the number one thing that held you back from pursuing a career in music? Yeah, I, I, I um, I'm not sure. I mean, I wasn't really pursuing a career in music. I was pursuing um, a love of music, mm. and I'm I'm thankful that that you know allowed me to move forward more quickly. But I think that there was one thing I remember. I was I was doing some classical guitar lessons early on, and and. Um, when I got the record deal, I was working with a fellow talented uh, musician, and he got this grave look on his face, and and like I, I thought he was going to be you know celebrating the fact that I just got a deal, and he said, "Do you think you're ready?" And it just sort of sunk in, and for a moment there was this panic, there was this fear, and what I realized is that you want to prepare, and you want to be a craftsman, and you want to be disciplined, and all those things are important, but you're never ready. If you think you're ready, man, oh man, you're in for a big surprise. You know, th it's going to throw so many things at you that you can't completely prepare for it. Um, but if the bedrock is firm and if the foundation is firm, the things that you've built your decision-making processes on, you'll be able to handle the things that come your way. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so that was, I think, a, a real uh, turning point for me. Well, that's so good. And to add to that, we, we just got to sit and had a, had a pretty funny moment on the front row. Brene Brown was <laughs> speaking. <laughs> And she was coming to us live from Houston, Texas, was supposed to be here, but had a family emergency. Yeah. And early on in the feed, she spotted a guy on the front row with a giant cowboy hat. Yeah. So she, she had a, a two-way feed going on so she could see the audience and then we could see her in this, in this uh, um, conference room. And, but the bandwidth wasn't good enough to, to handle both. So they turned off the feed for her, the audience. But right before they did, she sees some guy in a cowboy hat, right? And so she needed to get some uh, audience participation, you know, kind of polling moments in, in her presentation. And uh, she's like, hey, there's some guy in a cowboy hat I think I saw. Um, <laughs> could you be our, our guy? Text us how many people are holding their hands up right now. And so I jumped on Twitter really quick. We went back and forth a bit. And it was funny. At the end of it, um, uh, it turns out that she's actually a big fan. And she tweeted... So on our Twitter account, and she's like, oh, I had no idea it was you, you know, so really cool. I had one big checkbox on my agenda for this entire time at the gathering, and it was make a connection with Brené Brown in some way, and, and uh, I think that that one worked out pretty well. So, so good. Really fun. She's amazing. But Just I love amazing. philosophically what she, she said, was, was talking about vulnerability, and this yeah. idea that if you're stepping out as an artist, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as any sort of creative you're not going to risk falling if you're brave. You will fall. You will fall. Yeah. It's inevitable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's um, a great idea that I included in a song that we put on a previous album called Risk. And that, that, that idea I, I found uh, quoted in a bit of a poem. And, and it was, uh, I'd rather build my wings on the way down. Mm. And, and so this concept so that, you know, you're going to jump over, you're going to jump over those cliffs and you kind of have to figure it out as you go. And I think the people who are vulnerable are the ones that do that, but also look for community mm. and accountability. And um, that's not always been my greatest 
greatest strength. You know, I, I, I like to get things done on my own. And, so, uh, and it, it's been really um, uh, a focus of mine to build more community and have people who, you know, can see the things that I can't see speaking in. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, I think that she voices that in just such a, an amazing way, yeah. you know. Um, that vulnerability piece is absolutely key. Yeah, that's good. So fourth question, what is something that is working for you right now? Uh, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, maybe some of it was forced, but I think that that, that um, or forced on me, that vulnerability thing has actually been something that um, has really helped me with my artistry, um, to help me to keep my focus. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to please people, and I think a lot of artists are. You, you want to fill in the gap in a conversation. You don't like there to be silence. You want to make sure everyone's entertained in some way. And I've tried to, to let go of that a little bit more and just be more comfortable in the silences um, to, uh, to you know, ask more questions and, and be willing to be the guy, only guy in the room with your hand up, even if it mm. makes you look stupid to ask that question. Um, and uh, I think that's something that for me has just come with more years of, of doing this. But um, I think that that's where those nuggets are for the great songs. And, uh, and you know, really what we're in the business of doing, I think, as musicians and artists is making connections through music, mm. it's creating community through music and, and friendships and relationships through music. It's, it's not about, hey, check me out, look, look what I'm able to do. It's look what I'm able to do with excellence that connects us. Mm. And, uh, and I, I think that that requires vulnerability. And, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to say that it's built a great community for us. Yeah, 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 it's good. So last question of the Full Circle Five. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you still possessed all the knowledge and experience that you have and you've got all these relationships but your business just completely went away and you had to start from scratch and you could do anything what would you do you know, I, I think I had that sort of uh, sliding doors moment in my life where I had to decide between the music business and 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 music and er, and and, uh, and medicine. Uh, my my uh, love for medicine came from my parents. My dad's a paramedic. My mom's a registered nurse, and uh, I always had this dream of uh, being a pediatrician. I love working with kids, and and I I think if you can help a kid. Um, you know, when they're ill at an early age, it's almost like you get to give them a second chance. And mm -hmm. I've always loved that. Um, so my, my dream was to work as an RN, get my degree, and then try and work my way through med school. And uh, I could still see myself doing something like that. I, yeah. I love being in a, a helping profession. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that's, you know, refreshing to me is that you can use the platform of music to raise awareness for causes mm -hmm. and to be very helpful. One that's important to us is the anti-human trafficking cause. Um, and, and we've started a... Um, uh, a movement called Not In My City. It's at notinmycity.ca that I hope people will check out. Um, and it's, um, it's been exciting to see the momentum that's picked up. You know, in the first five days, it raised about a quarter of a million dollars. We've had great uh, national um, visibility uh, given to us through even retweets from our prime minister here in Canada. And uh, we're seeing the systems gathering um, in a really powerful way in Alberta to, to make a stand against this in some, some uh, uh, meetings that we've already had. So I'm, I'm excited to see where that ends up going. But yeah, I probably would move on to those sort of more helping professions if I had to do it. Yeah, yeah. good. Well, uh, I'm here with Paul Brandt, for those of you guys who maybe just hopped on or listening here at the Cult Gathering Conference. And no, it's not an Illuminati event. <laughs> no, you look at right. that, that triangle with the eye and you might think that it is, but no, <laughs> not, not quite. But it, it did take a lot of vision, absolutely, to put something like this together. And I think Ryan Gill has yep. uh, just an, an amazing, amazing vision um, for, this, uh, for this incredible event. So good. So you've been working on new music. Yeah. And do you care to share about what's stirring in you? What, why are you... That's always the question of why. Why well, are you working on it? See, you don't know this, or, or I've shared it with you since, but you were chosen to be a part of this. You didn't, you didn't actually have any, anything to do with uh, whether or not it was going to happen or not. And, and you, know, you mentioned that uh, Brad uh, from High Valley had uh, hooked us up for a writing appointment. I, I called Brad, um, and uh, you know, I, I had an experience right before I called him, probably about eight months before I called him, where I was, I was riding my motorcycle, and I, I took a trip down to... Uh, um, Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a new motorcycle rider. My first trip on a motorcycle, I, I actually broke my wrist. So, you know, it, it wasn't a good start. But, uh, you know, got, got more comfortable with it, took this trip, and um, was listening to a lot of music. You know, um, the, the music side of getting a great helmet was really important to me. It had to have a great sound system in it. And mm -hmm. I remember riding down, and I was listening to um, uh, For King and Country, you know, their, their most recent uh, project, and, and just really getting into it. Love their music. And, and um, yeah, I was spending a lot of time thinking about what I was going to write next, what this next thing was going to be, and um, you know, just a lot of it, it, 
when you do this, you pour yourself all in. I mean, yeah. you got to think really hard about whether you're not, you want to do another round of music or not yeah. because you're all in. And so I was, I, was, I was spending a lot of time thinking about that and praying about it. And I was listening to that music. It was very inspiring. And I remember I have a lot of these moments where, when I'm praying where it's a PS moment. It's like I finish my prayer and then I'm like, oh, yeah, and I forgot. What about this? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it, I think a lot of times those are the things that I don't really expect to ever happen. Um, and I said, you know, uh, God, this, this is such a, a cool album that I'm listening to. And I don't know who produced mm. this or who was a part of it, who the writers were, or any of that stuff. But it just would be great if I had a chance to meet them someday. And, uh, you know, they probably wouldn't even let me in the room. <laughs> and uh, and I, I remember um, uh, calling Brad. And I said, you know, I, I don't know who you've been writing with, but I'd love to get together with a few of your guys. So he set up an appointment for, um, you know, me and you and, and, uh, and Ben Stennis. Yep. And uh, I walk in the room and the first thing I see is a, a gold record and a Grammy Award for, for King and Country <laughs> with your name on it. And, uh, and I was like, okay, God's got a pretty good sense of humor yeah, here because I yeah. had no idea. So um, it's just been a real joy and a, for, for me, honestly, a confirmation mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, this is something that's supposed to happen. So this, this music uh, was inspired by that motorcycle trip. Um, and and the journey um, that we took, and also you know the journey of my um, uh, you know, time in the music business to this point is also a bit of a metaphor for all of this. It revolves around concepts of truth, and revolves around concepts of of um, uh, you know uh, uh, risk and, and all of those kinds of things. And um, I, I'm really excited to get this music out. You know the first uh, the first single was the journey, and the second one coming is uh, the one that we wrote together that day, uh, all about her and and. Um, you know, kind of inspired. It's it's exciting to talk about it today. This is my 21st wedding anniversary, and and yeah, it was happy anniversary. Thank you so much. It was inspired by you know story us sharing stories about our yeah. wives, you know, and and uh, um, so I'm really excited for people to hear this and hear the whole project. Yeah, and then an EP. Yeah, so there's six songs on this first uh, uh, project. Um, it's a, a six-song EP, and it's called uh, uh, Paul Brandt, The Journey, YYC. And so this is volume one. So uh, a hint, hint, there's more to come. But um, uh, the YYC is the airport code for Calgary. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a song on this first EP called YYC BNA. BNA was the, is the airport code for Nashville. It came from the old historic uh, Berry Field designation that used to be there in Nashville. And that's where the B came from. And so people often look at that and go, wait a minute, why BNA for Nashville? But my, my journey has been so much about being between those two cities mm-hmm. and the, the cultural clash and the learning and all the things that came from that for me. The last line is, once you, once you make that trip, you ain't coming back the same. And it's true. Um, there's just something amazing about Nashville. And, and uh, so we wanted to celebrate that story in, in this new project. I love it. So people can find you at... They can find me at Paul Brandt on Twitter. Uh, I'm Alberta Bound on Instagram and um, uh, the Paul Brandt official on Facebook. Uh, obviously, just check out everything at paulbrandt.com. And um, you know, stay in touch with us. We've got a great uh, um, way through our newsletter for you to just sign up and, and know what we're doing, whether it's music-wise or philanthropy-wise, some of the work that we're doing for Not In My City. So, yeah, check out paulbrandt.com for all the information. And, again, notinmycity.ca. Yeah, I hope phenomenal. people will check that out. It's, yeah. um, it's something that's really needed uh, in North America. You think about these things, trafficking going on in places around the world, but it's happening all over North America. And it requires strong, brave people to get vulnerable and stand up and say, this, this can't happen anymore. Great. It's awesome. Well, I'm Seth Mosley. I've been sitting here with Paul Brandt at the Cult Gathering Conference Inside the Glass. We're on the Made It Music podcast by Full Circle Music. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Man, are they going to let us out of here? I hope they. I don't know. <laughs> We're inside to, the they glass. I think you have to press baseball bat your way out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>